thing and i think that was my first experience of you know anything moving in the industry or like my first you know ex- part of exposure to like an actual big artist and stuff so that was probably like one of the best days of my life our guest this week is grammy nominated producer and songwriter philip kembo known as dr chai Dr. Chai has co-produced and co-written for global superstars like Sean Paul, Pitbull, Chris Brown, Camila Cabello, Dua Lipa, and many others. Born and raised in Harare, Zimbabwe, Dr. Chai found his way just making beats and utilizing Twitter to foster connections in the industry. As he progressed, he began to see the value of momentum and being in the room as the magic happens. Dr. Chai joins us to talk about going across the world to pursue his dreams on this episode of The Big Break. All right, so today we have with us Dr. Chai calling in from, where Where are you calling us from? Hey, I am in Los Angeles, California right now. Okay, and that's, uh, I think that's for you, it's a particularly uh, good question to ask because you, I don't know, are you are you usually in one place for a long period of time? You be <laughs> all over the map <laughs> Yeah, I mean, pre-quarantine, it was a, a lot of traveling. I'm from Zimbabwe. Mm-hmm. And so I born and raised in Zimbabwe. I grew up there. My family's over there. And then I went to uni in England. So I was in England for a couple of years. And then I eventually moved to LA to pursue the whole music thing. And I guess the beauty of it has kind of been, I've been blessed and fortunate to like travel a lot through the music and shoot videos in different countries. So the past year I kind of went to Cuba and Dubai for work and London. So it's been all over the place, but I guess uh, everything going on has me in Los Angeles for the time being. I understand. I understand. And so I, I want to talk about some of those other places, but you, you did mention just, just quickly the last few episodes here I've been leading with talking about just the, uh, you know, the quarantine situation and the stay at home and whatnot. Mm-hmm. You know, um, just curious how you've been managing, you know, through all of that. Is it, has it uh, impacted any of your work or, or anything in those lines? That's a great question, man. Honestly, like I think, the first couple of weeks were really rough just in the sense that I think there was so much uncertainty and so much uh, misinformation and kind of the fear side of it and not knowing what to believe. It's like, man, do we go outside? Do we stay in? Do we go to the grocery shops? And like, especially in LA, there was like a lot of panic. And I think as far as music goes, I think the big question was, you know, well, how do things progress, you know? as this continues and, you know, eventually the shows got canceled and that sort of thing. And I think everyone was just trying to figure out what the new status quo and the new world would mean, you know, as far as like, how do you work productively? Is it just home? Are we ever, are we going back to studios anytime soon? So the first couple of weeks was a lot of question marks. Um, but I think it sort of turned into some much needed downtime because I think the nature of just music sometimes is you just, oh, it's one thing off the, to another. You're like bouncing off walls. And like, it was kind of nice to like have a little bit of a pause and it'd be like, okay, you know, there's bigger things going on in life than songs. And it was a bit of a reality check just as far as, you know, think about the things that are important and, you know, where, where, where your own head is at. And then that kind of progressed into, okay, this is where it's at now. How do I work from home? So now it's kind of just, fully working, writing, recording from the house, which has kind of been a nice change, to be honest. Yeah, it's interesting. Everyone has a little different take on it, particularly those. I mean, it doesn't sound like you were necessarily had tour dates that were uh, impacted, but um, but the, to have the to have the ability to, to work and create, produce from home, I'm sure certainly makes the situation go by a little bit yeah. more smoothly. That's been the saving grace. Cool. And I like the idea of just sort of that re- that, that time for recharge, right? I think, I think people don't give that enough credit that – that ability to let the juices sort of uh, reaccumulate a little bit. Oh, hundred percent. Right. So let's uh, let's kind of go back a little bit. You mentioned you were you're from originally uh, Zimbabwe. Yeah. And so boop, 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 boop. there Shout you out go. Zimbabwe. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> how, how did you, I, you know, forget about even making music and whatnot? Like, what was your first you know uh, just experience with or appreciation of you know music in general like that that what do you remember first being drawn to it or any or is that getting too far back to the memory yeah well i kind of just grew up around a lot of music and not in the sense that i i played anything um oh my dad will love this but you know i hate to give him any kind of credit when it comes to this subject but 
my dad used to play a lot of music around the house and it was just like it would be anything from like local artists like Thomas Mafumo and you know to Coldplay to U2 to like Fleetwood Mac to just you know it was just a range and it was everything and so I think my earliest memories of kind of like always being like hey what's this and like oh okay what's what what's that genre and like what's going on over there it was just kind of my dad around the house bouncing from Zimbabwe music to Nigeria music to American music to English music and I think I, that's sort of where I kind of developed more of like a a crate digging kind of attitude and just kind of became obsessed with like finding out about artists and their stories and like the different genres and different countries and that sort of thing. Um, so kind of very early on, I think in Zimbabwe too, one of the things is music is just such a big part of the culture, like most African countries. So you'll go to church and like, everybody's singing in like harmonies, but never practiced. <laughs> like you go right. to like school and like choir is a big part of it or being part of the band and stuff. So it's kind of, you know, always subconsciously being around music. Was there a point where you thought, where you realized maybe that your, uh, your interest in it maybe was, was greater than others. And, and I asked that because, and I, this is something I ask everybody that I, mm-hmm. that I talk to on the show, because there's lots of us that, that appreciate music and love to listen to music, but there's only a so, certain select few that take it the next step to try to like engage with it further to try to, um, you know, either produce music or create music themselves right. or perform music themselves or somehow get involved in the space. There's a, there's another, there's another layer there somewhere. So I'm just kind of wondering where that layer emerged for you. I remember the exact day. <laughs> uh, all right. That's what I like to hear. That like, sounds like a story. <laughs> okay. So check this out. So I am in grade five. So fifth grade at this point, mm-hmm. I was mm-hmm. probably like 10 in Zimbabwe and we had our first show and tell ever. And, you know, I was like, wow, show and tell. I always see this on TV and stuff, but, like, we had never done it. I was like, this is cool. Like, show something and tell about it. I was like, okay, great. And so I get ready. I think, you know, me being me, I, like, brought, like, an, an encyclopedia or, like, a geography book. And I was like, look at all the countries of, I don't know, something just a little, you know, <laughs> not fun. <laughs> Mm-hmm. In that sense. And I remember like, I was like, yeah, I'm going to show like pictures of like when you went on holiday to this one place and blah, blah, blah. And I had this one friend called Tanaka. And in the midst of everyone, like kind of showing all these, like what you'd expect to show and tell, he walks into the classroom with like a little boom box and a microphone. I was like, okay, well, this just got interesting. And he like presses play, he stands in front of the class and just like tells everyone, he's like, keep quiet, everybody. It's my turn. I was like, okay. (laughs) And so he just like stands in front of the class and presses play and like a beat starts playing. I was like, what is this? And he starts rapping. I was like, you can rap? And like, he like for the next minute just proceeded to like rap and sing this song. And at the end of it, he was like, thank you so much, guys. My artist's name is whatever it was at the time. I was like, you made that? I was like, okay, bro, you have some serious explaining to do because we are here talking about books and pictures and you clearly went home and recorded an album. <laughs> I didn't even know <laughs> that was possible. And so at the end of it, he was, I was like, bro, like, tell me, like, what is that? And he's like, man, it's this program. It's called Fruity Loops. And like, this is how it works. And like, you can make beats. I was like whoa and like for the next kind of like year he would just kind of i'd call him after school and he'd like teach me over the phone I'd be like, and then what do you do and he'd be like okay so how you make drums is and then that kind of became a little obsession because you know uh, i kind of grew up like parents on the more conservative side in the sense that you know you had to be home at a certain time you know make sure you finish your homework and that sort sure. of thing and like um obviously i was 10 so i couldn't go to the club anyway but I think it was more that, you know, music ended up being something that was like very PG and like I could justify doing it for hours past my bedtime. I'd be like, I'm just making beats. And like, that's really interesting. Yeah. Cause so it's like a lot of people, you know, you're, you're around music, you're hearing music, you're consuming it. But that first time where you actually saw someone creating in front of you live sort of flipped a switch, it sounds like a little bit. Oh, and, and you had to learn more. That's great. Yeah. That's totally. great. So yeah, so I, I think I did a little bit of reading before we we uh, started talking today, and, and I th- and think something about uh, you first started creating music around thirteen, I believe it said in one of your exactly, one of your bios. Yeah, what exactly. was that? Was that was that what you're talking about just now? Was just yeah, creating so music with that your friends? Was kind of, yeah, that was kind of just like back home. We started like I think 
taking it a little more seriously and just decided like, Hey, this is kind of cool. And like, at the time there were a lot of rappers and like young kids, like kind of starting to do it in Zimbabwe in the sense of like putting out songs and being on the radio. And we were like, man, I think we could kind of like do this. I don't know. This could be like, maybe we should just like make CDs and like give them to people and like rap and like make beats and stuff. And like, it just kind of, you know, one thing turned into another and that just became like what we did. Now, was it always something that you thought you would turn into a career, or was it more of a hobby? And I, and I ask this because I, I also, in reading your your uh, background before we talk, you you had you went out to university for topic subjects that weren't necessarily music related, <laughs> marketing and things yeah. like that. So, why don't you walk me through that a little bit? Like, what was your what was your plan? If I could put quotes okay. around plan a little bit, I'm glad you asked. So, okay, good. In my mind, I was like, uh, okay, I would love to do music, you know. I love to make beats become like, you know, my dream was to become a producer. And I was like, kind of grew up listening to Timberland and Pharrell and Kanye West. I was like, man, like, that's amazing. You know, and I think at the time, like producers were very much like the rock stars and it was just interesting, you know? Uh-huh. And so I kind of didn't really know how I would ever end up in the actual music industry. I didn't know, like, how do you get there? Like, do you call somebody? Like, I didn't know anything about it. Yeah, I was like, how did you just... 1-800-MAKE-MUSIC, yeah, something like yeah, literally. that. I was like, do you call the radio? I don't know, how did, where do beats go? It was just, you know, <laughs> not a lot of information, but I knew that that's what I wanted to do. But I had reached that age where, like, it was time to go to uni and or college. And in Zimbabwe, when I reached that age, you kind of tend to go outside of the country because the tertiary education is a little tricky and so people tend to go to south africa or canada or america or england so i went to england and i actually studied marketing um because i think you know african parents it's like if you say hey i'm gonna go study music it's like really (laughs) (laughs) it's like uh, you know and at the time i don't think i had any desire to study music but i kind of found like i was like okay what else am i interested in and what's like kind of cool and my plan was like, okay, mate, I'll go get my degree, you know, figure this thing out. At least I'll be in England and not Zimbabwe and like a little closer to things. And so that kind of became the thing. So I, I went to study marketing in Lancaster in England, shout out Lancaster, and kind of was just like studying and making beats as I studied. And like just kind of still didn't really have much of a plan, but was kind of trying to figure it out as I go. So I'd like cold email people and like just like really study like who was on the charts and who produced this song and who wrote this song and and that was when like twitter was starting to like you know really like become a thing and so i'd find them and i'd tweet them and i'd dm them so my twitter was just like hey uh, can i get your email to send like some songs and like hey do you mind so that that kind of you know that that was kind of the reasoning behind going to study um and i love studying so it was more of a case of trying to figure out like, okay, how do I end up like in music someday? Okay. So you're, you're studying marketing. You're still dabbling. I'm going to call it dabbling. I don't know if that's the best word for it, but okay, great. So you're dabbling in music. Good, good. Thankfully. (laughs) And then, um, and so you get your, you get your, your your degree. Now did, I, I I don't know the timeline here of what happens here. So maybe explain to me, when did, when did any of that dabbling sort of strike a chord, so to speak? When did, when did, when did something hit where where you got a response back that was meaningful? So what happened was I was in uni for about three years and I stayed for another year and did my master's in marketing. And one of my best friends who was already uh, in America at the time and like we grew up together, like our parents went to school together and stuff. His name's Bantu. And he was kind of like, we were kind of like best friends from childhood. He was like, hey, before you go and like do this nine to five thing, why don't you come to LA for a little bit and just like sleep on my couch and like see what it's like before like you go off and like before real life begins. Yeah, exactly. And so I was kind of like, well, seems like a great idea, but I have two parents. I need to go home and convince that like this is a great idea. So I kind of went home and I was like, okay, mama, daddy, Bunchy said I could come and stay on his couch and, you know, try out this music thing for a little bit before, you know, life restarts. And I thought my parents would be like, uh, no. <laughs> and they were kind of just like, you know, uh, I think it's a good idea. You must go. I was like, what? Oh, that's fantastic. I was, I was like, I don't know what is going on, but I'm not going to ask any questions. <laughs> Literally like booked a flight that day and um, 
went to LA and just kind of speculatively slept on my best friend's couch. And from that couch, I would kind of just like make beats every day. But now you're starting to like meet people a little. Like, you know, he would like just kind of try to introduce me to people, but I was still just kind of like emailing people and tweeting people and sending beats. But now at least there's the there's the little, you know, appeal of if someone responds, you could go and meet them or hang with them. And that was kind of the thing. And so one day I see a tweet from um, Sermstyle, who is a really good friend now, an amazing producer. And at the time... Sorry, who was that? Sermstyle. Okay. And at the time, Serm was a producer that I really looked up to, still look up to. And I was like, man, I'd love to work with him. And he had just decided one day to tweet his email address. And I just happened to see it within maybe the first 15 seconds of him tweeting it. I was like, wow. I should send him some beats, you know? Well, after all, I'm on the couch, just chilling. I should send, like, beats. And I literally sent him some music, and literally 15 minutes later, he was like, bing, and I was like, hey, I love these. Like, these are amazing. Like, do you want to meet up and grab lunch sometime? I was like, what? I almost passed out. And that was kind of the first person who was, like, in the industry who, like, kind of responded to something and like you know that e- that dm or like that tweet ended up with us grabbing lunch one day and me hanging out with him and having a great conversation and deciding like you know telling him my story and we decided to just kind of work together on like beats and so one of the ideas i'd started on the couch <laughs> couch life was an idea i ended up finishing and sending to so many was like i love this and he's like this is amazing i'd love to work on it let's see what we can do with it and literally a week or two later, he just sent me like a video and he was in the studio and he was like, it was like the beat that we had done and it was Sean Paul kind of singing on it. And so I'm wow. like, it's like 2 a.m. I'm like half asleep. Like I like wake up. I'm like, why is this guy sending me videos? And like I wake up to like this Snapchat of Sean Paul rapping to this song and almost like I literally just like burst into tears because I was like, I don't know what this means. (laughs) I don't know if this means it's a song now or if this means like, I I don't know. Are we friends? Like, I don't know. (laughs) Yeah. You're like, where do we go from here? This is like, you know, but I was just like, wow. Like I grew up like listening to Sean Paul and like the, the year before I moved to LA, I had gone to watch him in concert and stuff. And then so for that to kind of happen that way was just the most mind-blowing thing. And I think that was my first experience of, you know, um, anything moving in the industry or like my first, you know, part of exposure to like an actual big artist and stuff. So that was probably like one of the best days of my life, even though nothing had happened yet. And it was just, you know, all I knew about it was a video. I was like in tears calling my mom, like, you guess what happened? <laughs> <laughs> well, what, 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 what wound up happening with that song? Did that song actually become something that was released? Yeah. So what happened was a tip, typical of music. Everything went from zero to a hundred. And it went from that day being two days later. So I'm saying, Hey, like, okay, Sean Paul just wrote this song and he loves it. And like, do you want to come to my house to listen to it and we can work on it? I'm like, yeah. (laughs) So I like go to his house and we're like, work on it. And next thing you know, it's like, they're like Sean Paul's labels loving it. And he hadn't put out music in a long time. So it was just like, the, the whole thing was just miraculous. I was just like, thank God, like, God, you are amazing. And like, um, it ended up being the case that we got a call a couple of weeks later from that day and they were like, Hey, so they really love this song. The label loves the song and they want it to be Sean Paul's next single. And they're going to get, um, do a leaper at the time when she was just kind of like bubbling at the time. I didn't even really know who she was yet. And they were like, they're going to get do a leaper to sing the hook and it's great and blah, blah, blah. I was like, okay, well, this is amazing. What happens now? Like, it's just like, at every step you're just like, okay, well then, then what, you know? And it's yeah, like, right. And it was like honestly the most like mind blowing and just growing and just incredible experience of my life to be able to like work on that. And then it turned out, you know, the song ended up coming out and like it became like a big song. And it was like my first placement, my first anything. And like it was the first time like I'd like travel, like go anywhere and like hear the song on the radio. And the song, oh, the song's called No Lie. And it was Sean okay. Paul featuring Dua Lipa. Okay. And that was like my first like placement with a big artist. 
That's amazing. Now, was there any like, and I mean, you know, I have to ask some other little kind of wonky details a little bit here, but like, you know, you, you, it's it's uh, it, it sounds like it was one of those things where you know, you tweet out a beat that someone listens to. The next thing you know, it's Sean Paul doing it. They they get you're getting together. You're kind of working together to finalize it and whatnot. At what point does like I don't know the paperwork come in where you're officially part of it, or like, are you worried that someone's going to take it? And you, you hear these stories about people stealing beats all the time and things like Honestly, this. Was, was there anything like that that came into the play? Or that's a great question. And it's like I think what happens is when it's like your first go around, it's like there's so many questions, and you're like, you just don't know what happens at the next stage, and you're like, okay, well. Am I still a part of the song? Is this like you just don't you just don't even know, you know? Yeah, you're happy. You're so happy just to be a part of it that you're not really Absolutely. thinking about where you might fit in down the line, right? And so I was fortunate enough to kind of um, I had some, and he was kind of guiding me through everything, and he was like, at every point, he'd be like, okay, so usually at this stage, what happens is you start discussing paperwork. Okay, at this stage, what happens is they start talking about the splits, and what that is is just. Um, you know, who wrote the song, what percentage of the song does everyone get? And this is my first time even knowing that this happens. And so right. that song ended up kind of being a crash course to like the music business side too. Um, and just kind of, you know, being fortunate enough to have like great people who were able to like coach me through it and guide me through it and kind of be like, okay, at this point, this is when you need an attorney because, you know, this is a production agreement and this is what this means. And you two are the producers of the song and they're like, you know, and it, it kind of, you know, became very businessy while we were working on it, but it was amazing to kind of just like learn how it works, just to kind of have confidence in it for like the next go around, you know? It's almost better to learn. That. I mean, I, I, as long as you're fortunate enough, which it sounds like you were, to, to be learning the process with folks that you're working with who you have your best interests in right. mind, because by, by, by literally learning what these these steps are as you're actually performing the steps in real life i think it probably takes hold more than like say reading it in a book exactly. uh, for some some people might do that but i know for me i'd probably be better learning the way that you did which was actually hands-on a little yeah bit it was it was awesome it was, it was really, really interesting really awesome all right, so I want to I want to talk about what happened next in a second, but I, first I have to jump back just for a minute. Where I, I just I find it really funny that um, your your big break was literally, I mean, your strategy and putting quotes around that uh, was to tweet at famous people from your couch. Is that the strategy <laughs> that we're? <laughs> that is exactly the strategy. One on one. It's so funny. I've done. I've had. I've had these conversations on the show where I've literally, you know, people who got discovered performing on the street in, a, in LA while living out of their car. I've talked with folks that, you know, just would, would, would pretend to be people that they weren't on email to get someone to reply. To them. <laughs> and, and now, and now I think I've heard it all where it's literally those, those desperate tweeting. Cause I, I'm the person that sometimes people would tweet at cause they think right. I'm somehow in, I'm involved in the music industry, which yeah, yeah, yeah. I, not at a level that I can in any way help uh, get your songs, but they'd be <laughs> tweeting me their stuff and it's just useless. And I was thinking, wow, who are these people? doing this you're one of those people doing this and it actually worked it's absolutely 100%. amazing to me. Yes. <laughs> and you know it's like it's weird because i think the question is always and the question i would always ask when i, I was starting out was like man so how did it happen like because you're always sort of looking for a roadmap to like you know how do i get from this place to like the next stage or like how do i get my songs heard by the right people and so on and i think the lesson that i kind of learned from all that is just kind of being persistent and just like you never know where the thing is going to come from and it's like sometimes it's from the most unlikely places and it's like a lot of the times it's from like the emails and the conversations and the things that someone might have been like well why would you do that you know but it's like I think there's something about not being in the industry yet and like being innocent and childlike and just like having that blind faith and like sending things and just being hopeful and not being jaded at all that I think there's like a really positive energy towards that kind of, you know, uh, just that passion and like commitment to just trying to make something happen at all costs. So yeah, that that beginner's mind sort of mentality. If absolutely, you, if you were, but I think it probably also helped that you had a, a beat that was <laughs> working. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like that, yeah. that 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 played a role. Absolutely. I mean, you were you were doing the work behind the scenes too, is what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, right? you weren't yeah. just throwing it out there you had stuff that you were working on um and and you saved the best of it to put out there when the moment came so that i think that's also obviously helpful <laughs> having, <laughs> having the music itself yeah, that part exactly <laughs> yeah yeah small item um so uh all right so after so that song gets cut right it's out there went out so what 
tell me a little bit about what, what happens next. I mean, a lot of times that could be it for some folks. They got that yeah. one thing and you go back and you're marketing in, you know, London or something. And so honestly, it's funny you say that because at the time when that happened, um, right before, like, cause my parents had agreed to sort of support me for, for three months while I was here. And we're just kind of like, Hey, this is what we can afford to do. We're going to like just pitch in as much as we can to like allow you to be there for a couple months and just kind of, you know, you got to like do what you can. It's not much, but just this is what we can do. And that three months was up. And so I was actually getting ready to pack it all up and go, go home to Zimbabwe. And I was like, man, I tried. It was great. Like the jig is kind of up, you know, and all this kind of happened literally like a week before I had to leave. And so it turned from that into, um, I got a call and so, so I was like, Hey, so, uh, he was signed, he signed to APG and he was like, Hey, like, um, APG is really interested in you. And like, you know, they love all the beats we've been making together and they, you know, they want to like meet you and like have a conversation with you. And I was like, what? I was like, wow. Okay. I have seven days to figure this out. And like, I literally had a meeting with them and like, I walked into the building, like shaking. Cause like, I was like seeing the people that I would had stalked for years <laughs> and like, there's like the buildings you'd like see on like on Twitter and just all this stuff. And you're like, Oh my God, like I'm here. Okay. Well, don't screw this up and say something ridiculous. <laughs> and like, and so we end up having a meeting and they're kind of like, Hey, like, you know, we love the music and we love everything you guys have been doing. And, you know, we're, we're fans and like, we'd love to like, figure out a way to keep working together and we'd love you for you to be a part of APG and we'd love to sign you. And so. And what is APG? I'm sorry. I'm not. So APG is artist publishing group and it's a publishing company. Got it. So uh, you signed a publishing deal essentially. Exactly. Yeah. So I I signed a publishing deal and then that's what allowed me to, to stay and like stay in the country and work and finally actually have access to like other producers and other musicians and kind of actually be able to start working within. As a growing artist or songwriter, keeping royalties coming in is important for keeping the bills paid. It's also important to keep an eye on those royalty payments. A lot of people we worked with here at Royalty Exchange were having a tough time making sense of the royalties they were getting paid. So we built a free tool called Know Your Worth that automatically analyzes every royalty payment made on your music. It breaks it all down in an easy to understand analysis with some insights that would be impossible to find elsewhere. Plus, it connects you with the thousands of investors on Royalty Exchange and allows them to make you offers on your music. So far, musicians have raised over a million dollars for new projects, new ventures, and a whole lot of other things just through the Know Your Worth app. If you're earning royalties, you should be keeping track of them, and Know Your Worth makes it easy. It only takes about three minutes to connect an account and the tool will automatically update over time. Just visit worth.royaltyexchange.com or find the link in the show notes to get started. Now, let's get back to the interview. Okay, and so what the, I, I don't want to skip over too many things, so please reel me back in if, if I'm getting too far ahead of myself. But what was, uh, you know, after that publishing agreement, what was the next, uh, the next uh, cut you landed basically the sophomore effort right the right, can yeah. he do can can he do it again <laughs> question mark it's kind of man everything sort of happened re- uh, like everything was happening at the same time and the next song I was kind of working on at the time was um it was a song called oh no it was a song for Trey songs called one by one mm-hmm. and that like sort of happened really quickly and it was like an R&B song I was like oh my god this is great and it's like it was my first experience of like being in a writing session and meeting writers and coming together for the first time and being like okay like how do you actually write songs and like be in the studio and make because before it's like kind of yeah before it was like you just you, yeah you're hanging out by yourself you come up with your own beats now you're yeah. collaborating with a bunch of other people and you've got to sort of play a, a your I don't know how to how to really phrase that but you got you got to play a role in a broader exactly scheme. and like you're kind of learning like wow like what is what is what is what a song supposed to sound like how do you write to beats and I think like being exposed to that ends up helping you to make beats that are writable if that makes any sense um and so after that like shortly after um I was part of a song called Hema that ended up being in the Fast and the Furious movie, and it was one of the singles, and later on kind of got nominated for a Latin Grammy. And it was kind of that, it was like, no lie, one by one, and then Hema happened, and it was kind of 
just like the same thing. Like one day it was a song that we had written in the studio. And the next thing you know, it was like, you know, diff- every single song happens in a different way. But that one was more my first experience of like, oh, wow, like people have revisions for the song or, you know, hey, um, they love the song, but they feel like maybe it needs more horns. And you're like, wow, I have to figure out how to make more horns. <laughs> and like, <laughs> and I think it's just at every step, because sometimes it's like something happens and it's like, there's no revisions. But that one was, I think we must have gotten up to version number 200 of that song. And it became that. You know, Camila Cabello ended up becoming, ended up uh, singing it, and it was it, they added J Balvin and Pitbull, and then it became this whole thing. So I think that song kind of taught me like how just seeing from start to finish how songs are put together, like the different things, like the different versions, the revisions, and kind of seeing it and be ending up in like a movie and a franchise that I love was just such a humbling experience and just such an incredible like learning experience too. Yeah, not to mention a Grammy nod. Exactly, which was, the, I guess, the first time my parents understood that I wasn't just, like, playing a piano in my room somewhere. <laughs> They're like, oh, my God. Like, I was like, yay. They're like, we love this. <laughs> exactly. No, that's amazing. That's amazing. But let me ask you, so just uh, thinking for a minute of the folks that might be listening, you know, those that, that might get that 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 first um, um, uh, hit, right, the the the, the – beat that you wrote on your couch that someone picked up and becomes right. a song and whatnot. The, 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 to me, that's, I mean, that's, a, that's an amazing bit of luck, uh, but also yeah, obviously, you know, you earned it and everything, but I mean, it, there's still a little bit of luck involved in that for, right. the, for it to happen. But then once you're in, I got I almost think that that might, you tell me, is that like almost the harder part to sort of adjust yourself into there was what you thought it was when you were working on things on your own, trying to get in. And then when you're actually in seeing how it actually is and knowing how to, I guess, roll with the, the punches, so to speak, in terms of uh, adapting a little oh, bit. Can totally. you talk a little bit about that? Like, is there were any lessons learned or any advice to give in terms of once you're in, how to stay in? Because you can easily get spit back out. Yeah. I think, you know, man, one of the lessons that I sort of was exposed to early was that because I was on a couch and sending beats and you're just hearing like, hey, they love this. This song became this. But once I, I got signed and I started like learning to write songs and, and being in these rooms with people, you realize that for every, you know, No Lie or Hema that I tell you about, there was maybe another hundred songs that nothing happened with. And I think it's in those songs that <clears throat> so much growth and so much kind of learning and sort of honing in your craft happens in those, maybe say in the next 50 songs you write so that you can write that one, yeah. you know? And I think it was more the ex- my expectation versus the reality was like wow okay now i have to really learn different skill sets and like you're learning like i think because i was just more of a producer and you're like learning these things and you're like wow okay now you're in rooms with someone and maybe you're learning how to record someone's vocal in a certain setting or like recording an artist or there's also the social side where you know you kind of in the room with people and you're learning that side too and just how like how you know how that feels and what your role is somewhere. And I think one of the things that happened that that can happen, or at least that happened to me is that you can have a bit of like an imposter syndrome sometimes where like you feel like you were like on a couch and then now you're like working with all these people you look up to and you feel like you're like, do I belong here? And you're like, at any moment they're going to realize that like, I like faked it until like I got here. And like, I think the lesson was in learning to value your role in in rooms. And I think that's something that, you know, you can learn on your own or learn with people, but it's like, it's sort of learning, like whether you're the producer or the writer or a, a session musician who came in to play guitar or the person who translated the song from Spanish to English, like, everyone's contribution is equally as important. And, you know, it's a bit like a soccer team. Like one person might be a goalkeeper and the other person might like score the goal, but, you know, one doesn't happen without the other. And I think um, there was definitely a lot of growth in just learning what my strengths were, what I actually enjoyed, and just kind of, you know, what role you enjoy playing within the scope of like writing songs and just kind of figuring out like, okay, if this is my career, like, what do I want it to look like? And 
what do I enjoy doing? And like, what's, how can I best serve the song from being in the room and like kind of figuring that out? So that was definitely really uh, interesting and uh, a great lesson to learn at the time. That's a really valuable insight, I think, because not, not only for folks who m- might be aspiring to be in the room, but also even for others who might be listening to or maybe mm-hmm. more on the, on the fan side of things. Because one thing that uh, I often see is the others in the room aren't always they're, they're they're not as visible, right? That that's right. The, it's Sean Paul, right? They, oh, that's Sean Paul's song. They don't realize all these other yeah. things that <laughs> had gone on, you know. Uh, and it's something that's that's just uh, historically has been very common within the music business, but I think is beginning to change more and more and more, particularly mm-hmm. with the with the elevated role of producer uh, uh, in recent years, anyway. So um, anyway, I, I just I'm just glad you brought that up because that's something that I think is always worth remembering is that there there's a lot of people that do play a role exactly. in the creation of this, and and and, and all of it is is uh, of value. Right. So, um, so like, uh, I just you, I wanted to understand you. You originally, when you were first thinking about you know being in, involved in with music, you said you wanted to be a, a producer first. And I was just wondering why why you gravitated towards that particular role. Most people, not most, but I'm sure a lot of people they they're thinking I want to be the star. And maybe the producer in your head was a little bit the star. <laughs> I don't know. But like, it almost seems like you get to have a little bit of both, right? You get to kind of hang back a bit, yeah. but you also get that. You know, that's an interesting question, man. I think when I was growing up, it was more like the creation, the creation of music that I loved. And it was like the beginning and like the making the beat or the writing the song and the this, I, I never really pictured like the standing on the stage and performing part. And like, I think when I was growing up, the, um, a lot of like the, the TV shows and a lot of the things that we were seeing and like being exposed to was finally seeing like how songs were made. And so, you'd see videos of Timberland in the studio and he'd like maybe beatbox something and he'd be like, and then like he'd press play on something else. And now it's like sexy back with Justin Timberlake. And you're like, Oh my God. Like, and there was just for some reason, I don't know, in Zimbabwe at the time, like that was just like the fun, like that was like the cool thing to like learn. It was like the hobby and like, you know how like you get like different phases and crazes. And it's like, maybe it's like the Pokemon phase and everyone's like swapping Pokemon cards at school. Like there was just a time where, especially in my year, where people were really interested in like beats and like making music and producing and like, I wish I knew how that happened. It was very bizarre, but I yeah, kind of get it. I mean, I just, like, yeah, the thing at the time. Cool. But uh, if I'm not mistaken, are you now um, in the process of stepping a little more forward in that? in that respect in terms of being more the the face and more the actual uh, singer and performer and things like this. Yeah. So um, after kind of being signed for a few years and producing for a few years and like, you know, having the most incredible journey that I'm like so grateful for, um, I kind of just, I think what started to happen was music started to shift a little bit and we started seeing a lot of different global genres, you know, making it, to America and so you started getting like the Latin music and like the reggaeton and the J Balvin's and the you know and the Despacitos of the world and then we started getting the Afro beats and the Afro Island songs and so we had one dance and like American artists were starting to collaborate with African artists and Latin artists and I think it was the shock of starting to hear some of the music that I grew up listening to making it over here and being viable and like kind of being like respected and being, you know, sung and performed by these massive artists I looked up to was so mind blowing. And I was like, man, this is amazing. Like I, I never pictured that when I was here that like African music and Island music would start, would start to become a thing. And I think I just started to get a sense of, you know, thinking that the most incredible thing was happening, especially being African and I think I always thought like man like when I was growing up like I never really saw like an African producer or an African artist that you know was singing these kinds of songs or this kind of thing and so you end up kind of having a, a responsibility to be like wow I think like I, I have a story to tell and I'd love to like you know if there's like a kid in Zimbabwe who I can inspire by putting out music and being an artist and like they can grow up thinking that they can do it I think that's that would be like amazing. And so I just kind of wanted to really be a part of that story and like the story of like, you know, finally Afrobeats is like here and it's like a story that needs to be told and like in any little way I can possible. I just got really excited about being a part of that, you know, 
of that story. And so I decided to become an artist and that's where the name Dr. Chai came from and started putting out music as an artist, which was the scariest thing ever because I was about to of, ask you that, right? Yeah. Now, now, now it's a, you can't hide behind anybody else anymore now, right? You're, it's, <laughs> it's sort of pointing at you. I know. It was like, I was like, at first you're like, this is a great idea. Then you start executing it. You're like, is this a good idea? <laughs> and it's like, I think you go from like kind of being, you know, behind the piano and like making beats to all of a sudden, like having photo shoots and having to like maybe model and sing and be in the forefront. You're like, wow, I don't even know how to pose. Like, what do I do with my face? Like, is this like, <laughs> you're, like oh, you're like, oh boy. It's like, you realize like all your 10,000 hours have been in just like making beats. And then you're like, oh boy, I have to start from scratch as far as like, you're like learning your voice and you're like learning to sing and you're learning to like, you know, just the artist side of it. And all of a sudden you don't have anything to hide behind. It's like, you know, yeah, really putting yeah. yourself out there. And, and uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say that, yeah, it was, uh, you know, really, really, really glad I did it. And I think so much transformation came from it just as far as the way I see music now, but also just even like personally, you know. Is it different writing music for yourself that you're performing yourself than it is writing uh, music for others? It is, you know, I think in the sense that when you're writing for others, you're always trying to figure out how to best articulate what you think someone wants to say. <laughs> it's like, mm-hmm. you're like, I think they would sing a song like this. So like, I think this would be cool. And like, you're kind of, it's like a moving target and it's, you know, and, and it's amazing within itself. But sometimes what happens is maybe, and in my experience was I was like, man, like I want to write an Afrobeat song. But at the time you're like, well, who's going to sing it? You know, because there were no Afrobeats artists at the time kind of crossing over and kind of like pop and like urban and like a hip hop and like all these, these genres, um, you know, nobody would really sing a song like that. Then I was like, well, should I just sing it? Because like, I feel like I would like, I love this music and like, I love these songs, but I think you end up kind of having a side of you or these songs that, you know, you kind of would love to get out there or the story that you'd love to get out there, but realize that maybe you haven't quite found, found the right vessel for them. So you and become the vessel yourself. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. That's and interesting. So it's been, yeah, it's been awesome, man. And like, I think it's been so cool to kind of, you know, I guess to your point, like when you're writing for yourself, you're kind of just, you know, like your, your art is like a reflection of where you are at that point in your life. And it's just you're like, this is where I'm at. And this is what came out that day, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And do you have, um, I guess, I don't have to name names necessarily, but do you have do you have a room full of people yourself now where there's others in that room helping you just the way that you were in the room for, for the performer before? Or yeah, is this so pretty much a one-man show? That's a great question. It's it's different for every song, but for me, it's like I have a bunch of producer friends that I love working with. Um, my roommate, Bantu, and I work together all the time and produce together all the time. And like I have a bunch of friends who I love writing with and artists as well. Like I love... Soki Siren, Johnny Yukon, there's like so many people that, you know, I work with a lot. And so it changes from day to day. Sometimes, you know, the four of you get together and write a song. And sometimes you'll just wake up in your boxes and start writing a song <laughs> and like you're by yourself. And I think it's just, you know, it's different every day. Okay. Okay. Looking back, I guess, at the, you know, the course of what we've been discussing so far today to where we are now, uh, anything that, that particularly stands out as like a, um, a particularly useful lesson that you learned or uh, a mistake perhaps uh, that you made that you would uh, would have liked to avoid if you could you know do it over again or anything that that maybe that maybe just stands out in some fashion that you would want others to know who might be walking a similar path hmm, that's interesting um I think there's a lot of things but I think the f- one thing that definitely comes to mind is realizing that it's totally okay for your vision to change and like your goals to change and your dreams to change while you're in your career. And so what I mean by that is like, you know, like sometimes you're like, okay, I'm a producer and maybe you like have songs you want to put out or you want to be an artist, but you're like, no, but like, I'm not an artist. Like I'm a producer. And it's like, you, you can be, you can be, you know, whoever you want to be. And it's like, sometimes there's a thing where it's like, no, I'm not a producer. Like I'm a producer. Like maybe I don't write or I don't this. And, I think sometimes we have a way and the industry has a way of pigeonholing 
ourselves just because you know it's easier to to you know to make sense of things like oh this person writes this person produces there's an artist and stuff and i think just kind of learning that it's okay for things to change while you're in the middle of them and it's like it's okay for you to fall in love with different genres and it's okay for you to be a writer and wake up and be like no actually i want to be an artist too and it's okay for you to decide okay now i want to direct videos and i think it's just always being willing to just be open-minded and like i think things just shift so much and it's like you know i haven't been here for that long and even in that time it's like you get spotify and the streaming changing and this and this and that and that and i think it's just always trying to be as flexible and as water as you can as possible just because things change all the time and like you're always trying to figure out what's your place in this new world and every year you're like okay things change a little bit like how do i fit into this and I think just always remembering that you do have the power to decide, you know, the direction that 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 goes. Yeah, just uh, to quote Bob Dylan in summary, I guess he not busy being born is busy dying, right? Oh yeah, that's amazing. I've never heard that before. <laughs> oh, it's a great that's a great line from one of his songs that I that was deep. kept kept with me. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's not me, man. It's him. You know, he, I, think he, that's, I was like, "Are you Bob?" That was crazy. No, no, no. That's that's uh, that's why he's got the Nobel Peace Prize, right? Like, or, or the, or the uh, whatever. So, all right, great. So, listen. Um, Thank you very much. This has been, uh, you know, super, super interesting. It's been really uh, great talking to you. I'd love to hear that. Like you've had quite a story, you know, moving around geographically, moving around your career path. I can't believe that you actually, your big break was actually just a random tweet out. Into that, <laughs> that, that, that to me is absolutely amazing. Um, but uh, anything that you've got, uh, any current projects or efforts uh, that you want to call out or, or, or promote or, you know, goals or plans that you want to, that you want to close with? Yeah. Um, so I guess um, now kind of, working on my EP and um, my first single comes out in, I'm not sure soon. <laughs> it's on the yeah, way. Yeah, and, it's always that question. Mark. Yeah, exactly. I don't want to give you a date, but uh, it's a song called Casanova that I'm really excited about. It's Afro beats and nice. yeah, really excited to, you know, to have that little baby out of the world. That's cool. I'll have to check it out. I, uh, my, my Afro beat, uh, I guess, appreciation stems pretty much from fella. Fella Cootie, of really? course. So, yeah, so yeah, big fella fan. But, oh, that's um, crazy. You know, oh, yeah, come on. The guy was an absolute legend, right? So, yeah, I've got, I, I I got to interview you next time. Oh, please, please. <laughs> It'll be far less interesting. <laughs> but yeah, no, check it out. It's Casanova, you said, right? Casanova, that's it. So that's Casanova okay. by Dr. Chai. All right, man. Well, I'll definitely take a look for it. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, good luck with you for with everything else, and I uh, hope to talk to you again soon. Hey, thank you so much for having me, bro. Keep up with Dr. Chai and his new releases. You can follow his Twitter and Instagram linked in the show notes. We'll be back in two weeks with a fresh new episode, but until then, stay safe. We'll see you next time. <laughs>